Welcome to Pass the Mic Podcast, where we tackled complex idea and difficult question with people who are curious, able to challenge their own belief, and who have the willingness to objectively listen and learn from the shared insights of others. Welcome to episode 24 with Jean-François Nouvelle. Today, I have the pleasure of discussing with Jean-François Nouvelle, who describes himself as a temporarily human being. For more than 20 years, Jean-Francois has worked in the field of collective intelligence, a modern research discipline that explores how living systems work and the evolution of our species. He works on the next crypto technologies that will soon enable the rise of super smart distributed organizations. Jean-Francois helps evolutionary leaders build enlightened organizations towards the post-monetary society. And I'll add with this element, interestingly, Jean-Francois lives in the gift economy. Several years ago, he left all his positions and mandate and tore up his resume in order to free himself from any etiquette and social status. With that, he gained full creative freedom to live in the present millennium. His new path allows him to help evolutionary leaders and train human new notes, those for whom the term go hack yourself designate a way to exist. Welcome, Jean-Francois. Thank you. So nice to have this time with you. I'm so glad to have you back. Together in a previous episode, we talked about how we can create a vegan and compassionate economy using Holochain, which is a form of blockchain. So I invite listeners and viewers to check out these three uh, video series on this discussion. But today, we're going to discuss the revolution happening right in front of us, right in front of our eyes, which is taking the world by storm, artificial intelligence and chat GPT. Now, in another episode, interestingly, I hosted a group of AI researchers and philosophers to answer one question, is AI conscious? This discussion was really fascinating because we tried to know whether artificial intelligent machines can have consciousness. And to answer that question, we had to explore how consciousness is not only about intelligence, but it also uh, includes self-awareness, intentionality and subjectivity, subjectivity. And we talked about the Turing uh, test, which we were just talking about before we started. We also highlighted the potential ethical implications of creating conscious machines. But at the end, we ended up agreeing that consciousness in AI remains a complex and unresolved question. Today, we're talking about artificial intelligence and chat GPT, and we'll see on this topic if we're able to find answers with you, Jean-Francois. I've sent a few questions for which I'm dying to answer to hear your answers, and we'll go wherever this discussion needs to go. So let's just get started. Hmm. I want to begin with one first question. Why are people so afraid of artificial intelligence and chat GPT? Uh, what's that all about? And what is it that we don't see? Mm-hmm. Well, first, we don't see what we don't see. So sometimes we don't know what we don't see. <laughs> um, so I guess we can have different levels of answers. Uh, first, uh, through history, we've seen people afraid um, most of the time of any new technological breakthrough. Uh, it happened for you know steam engine. It happened for computers. It happened for telephone. You know, many people would think that uh, telephone would kind of penetrate in households and you could cheat on your husband because the husband goes to work and you stay at home. And <laughs> now you suddenly have someone sneaking in, into the house without, you know, using the front door or some kind of back door and things can happen out of control. And you would have lots of people afraid also of those things. So you, in general, you have this kind of general fear uh, and I remember 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the fear about an internet itself. Um, I remember um, politicians in France trying to outlaw the internet, and they had some, you know, other reasons for that, like with lobbies and you know, France Telecom and all those things. But we have this kind of general um, observation we can make. However, we also see um, a second level, I would say, of people uh, scared by what they may have heard through or seen through sci-fi, like, you know, the robot, the intelligence 
takes over, takes control and has a bad intention and, and makes some kind of dystopian world and all these things. And I don't say it cannot happen. Of course, we want to talk about this, but I think it also has some sci-fi background also in this that may not have um, too much rationality in this. And so I guess we want to take this question into now what kind of rational fears we could have or we should even have, which then leads to maybe a conversation among more specialized uh, people, because I don't see much awareness so far in the large public about the real threats that um, AI can, uh, you know, can bring to this world. And by the way, I want to make it clear here that I don't claim any expertise in AI per se. I have a field of uh, expertise as a researcher in collective intelligence, in augmented social intelligence, in distributed systems, uh, but not in AI. But of course, all these fields kind of, um, you know, <laughs> entangle each other. So I can, but I want to say that we'll always speak from my pers perspective as a researcher and um, more like collective intelligence. That makes sense. And so you're saying people are afraid of AI because of the fear of the unknown, which has been fed mm -hmm. by years and generation of sci-fi movie and monsters and robots taking over the human species. Do you think there's something else that feeds this fear, um, this resistance that many people have? Um, is it something? Is there something around the idea of power? Mm. Well, first, who, um, what do you mean by people? Like, do you mean the general public? Like, what you know, people would say around a dinner table, uh, or do you do you mean like the people involved? in this field of research uh, and on, or other people like me, like deeply connected to that? I would what say uh, both, both. We can definitely okay. see some form of uh, resistance. Okay. I mean, recently, some of the experts have asked for a halt on pushing forward okay. the development of ChatGPT yes. 4, 5, et cetera. But also yes. in the public sphere, um, and you can see that in the news or even on social media, some resistance from professionals in actually using ChatGPT. Okay. So I think we should definitely um, focus maybe on, on people like really involved in the field and who try to bring very rational questions uh, and the debate and controversies we need to have in that field. I don't feel much interested in what the general public mm. says because also I don't have like evidence or data. I just have like a feeling, you know, hearing people around me, but it doesn't mean anything. Um, but so uh, we have a few, a few things. First, um, an AI can blindly grow based on the orders of growing from its creators. And you could think of, you know, any AI that, where you would say, okay, you have to become like hyper specialized in um, playing chess and, and any board games in the world. And we want reality to become a big board game. And it could literally transform the world and uh, make, you know, our species extent and make this planet a big, you know, board game or, you know, thousands or billions of board games getting played because AI has just, you know, fulfilled that. And it can... Um, if it has this capacity to expand, that means it can bring in more and more data and knowledge. And then, of course, by uh, self-reinforcement, you know, improve this knowledge and then learn or use some piece of, co of code to break into, you know, server, firewalls and all these things, and then start to use more power for itself. Like you could have in 24 hours, a burst of AI, like a billion hackers, you know, top level hackers uh, working at the same time and breaking in every possible system in the world. And then to take control of those things for its own purpose of, from, for, for its own original purpose of, you know, either making board games or delivering uh, knowledge or whatever you give, whatever original intention you give to that AI. So it leaves lots of questions. First, you know, Let's, let's just uh, follow up on this scenario. It breaks in you know, every possible platform, your, your smartphone, everywhere. And now you have pieces of code that kind of gather data, more data, more knowledge for the AI that delivers you also information, news, fake news, whatever. Um, and that becomes interactive with you. 
the next step that AI would need, it would need also um, things done in real life, like in the physical life, because so far it works on computer. Like if you turn off your cell phone or your or your laptop, then you have no more AI with you, right? How would it change the physical world around you? Well, it would need to use human beings for that. And how do you use human beings? Well, what if uh, that AI would pay you for doing something? What if that AI would give you some forms of reward, like becoming famous if you if fame works for you? What if that AI blackmailed you because you have some you know, dirty secrets that you want to hide or you think you see them as dirty secrets, whatever. But AI could have very powerful leverages also on people, either to have them work for it or through uh, fear and blackmailing and uh, those kinds of things. So this does represent a very serious scenario that many specialists uh, see, hence why they say we have to keep it in a closed container because if it starts to write code out there uh, to break in you know, maybe your cell phone and then another cell phone and maybe this server here and so on, it may start to you know, burst uh, in an exponential way. Does that make any sense? It does, but what you're talking about is really the intention. And so my question is, who gives the intention to AI? Because mm -hmm. that leads to creating leverages, yes. whether they are mm -hmm. positive or negative. So who control those intention? Who gives intention to AI? Well, I think you, you asked the very core questions because I hear people asking, you know, should, should we fear AI? Just like, you know, should we fear computers or should we fear TV uh, or the telephone? And I ask this question all the time, whose hand holds the hammer? Um, I think that leads to the to the a much more interesting question, like who does it serve? Does it serve like personal private interests or political interests? Well, in this case, I feel extremely scared about AI because it can leverage the, you know, the power for these intentions and the people in control of those tools. Uh, you know, then they can use facial recognition, they can use uh, robocops, uh, they can do whatever they, they want on your bank account, uh, they can fire you on work, whatever, they can have a full control uh, of society, okay? So either private interest or, or governmental interest uh, seems like a very dangerous kind of AI, okay? Now, hence the question, can we make AI not only open source, but controlled by uh, society itself. That for me seems more more like a question we should ask about AI rather than dangerous or not dangerous. Like anything, like nuclear power, uh, like cars, <laughs> you know, laser, whatever. Uh, writing, you know, you can use writing in such a dangerous way. Uh, imagine if writing remains just in the hand of a few, which it happened, by the way, in past history, and we know the consequences of that. Right. Very true. Um, okay, so the reason why people are afraid of artificial intelligence is the fear of the unknown, fed by sci-fi, the fear of becoming obsolete uh, mm -hmm. as human, so, yes. because mm -hmm. potentially being controlled uh, and manipulated by AI, and that goes to the third reason of this fear, which is who creates the intention, who, who does it serve? that could also be a cause of the fear. Yes, and uh, it leads also to more questions because you may have a group in control of the first intention, you know, like chat GPT. I mean, the claim of um, open AI as a society, they say, well, we want to serve the greater good. Like in most cases, you have highly well-intentioned people. Like they really want, just like people at the, you know, the beginnings of social media, they really claimed um, genuinely that they wanted, you know, people to connect and ideas to flow and more democracy in this world and, you know, all these things. And then AI, first versions of AI came in uh, to find a way to capture your attention, hence the, what we call the attention economy, so that you would spend more time on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok and all those things. And so it has developed meta algorithm. That means you have like a one special algorithm for you, Virginie, or another one for me, because they know what, you know, how I work on Instagram or on TikTok and what will keep me uh, st stuck into those things. So we already have AI controlling us in many, many, many levels. 
connected to the original intentions of the makers, but then it kind of escaped mm -hmm. their original intention. And the next versions of AI could also escape the original intention just by creating, of course, poisonous emergent effects that we cannot see. But also, if it has to grow by itself, if you if you you know create uh, self reinforcement mechanisms like okay, learn by yourself, improve your capacity to resonate, improve your knowledge, check your knowledge in a in a better way, and so on, then you give it autonomy. And that autonomy can become its own intention, like way beyond the intention of the creators. And we have already many examples of this, you know, like AI learning new languages that we didn't know, AI producing code um, that no one has trained it to, to do, but it, it, uh, it delivers like amazing kind of code and, and uh, you know, a million times faster, all these things. So then we have this question, like, can it become its own intention? Uh, it having having its own autonomy, and then you, it connects with another important question about substrate, uh, the notion of substrate independence. You see, um, we've. What do you mean by substrate? Let me go there. For millions of years, uh, memory and reasoning could happen in needed to happen in a biological brain, you know, a kind of carbon-based organism. Okay, so. As a human being, but also as a bird, or you know, any kind of advanced form of life, it would retain information, process information, uh, make uh, reasoning at their level based on the carbon-based substrate, what we call life forms. Okay, but now we've seen recently, uh, I mean, in the past fifty or sixty years, that we can make storage of knowledge and information, and algorithms, that means, or functions of reasoning on other substrates than the bio biological ones. You know, for instance, you can even, uh, uh, you can use a, a sandbox and put some pebbles there to, to do, you know, bits and make uh, the memory of a number or, um, or the uh, representation of a word. You can use other substrates for that. Now, the sandbox remains a passive object, but you can use now what we call computers, so that from this early memory, it can start to make now reasonings, you know, calculations, and then chess games, and then guess the next word to put in that sentence, and all those things. Does it happen on a human brain? No. Does it happen on a carbon substrate? Absolutely not. It happens on the silicon, silicon substrate. So some people think or claim or fear that, okay, well, maybe life and consciousness doesn't need the carbon substrate or will cannot evolve any further on the carbon substrate, and it may evolve, evolution may shift this not only intelligence, but then consciousness into um, um, silicon substrate or maybe other forms of substrate. But I think we have to remember this, just this fact that we don't even need to discuss anymore, that functions and memory can operate on any forms of substrates. Okay? Now, does it? do we need carbon and cells and DNA to have consciousness and subjectivity? No one knows yet. But we certainly can see, if we look in the past, a relationship between the complexity of a system that self perpetuates itself, that grows on itself, that learns, okay? So um, a parallel or a progression between those substrates and complexity and consciousness and complexity. The more complex, the more consciousness it has on a biological substrate. But why couldn't, he, why couldn't it evolve into other forms of substrates, you see? And, and just that, just by not knowing, not having like a, and evidence that it will, well, that makes very big, important questions, which I don't hear very much in the large public, I would say. Does that make any sense? Yes, and I invite the listeners and viewers to rewind a little bit what you just said and 
listen uh, to you again. I think you're opening a door to questions that very few people are asking. Um, that brings me to my second question, which is since you were talking about the evolution of human species, when I look, when I imagine uh, the evolution of human species. I imagine in my mind the discovery of the fire, the invention of the will, the electricity, the discovery of the telephone, the computer, and now artificial intelligence and the digital self. What does artificial intelligence and this digital self mean for the evolution of our human species? Mm. So um, as, as someone who participated in the early days of the internet, it, it became, even at that time, like in the mid nineties, uh, very obvious that we would have more and more a part of ourselves online, okay, in the digital world. And of course it already exists. You have, you Virginia, you have probably, um, I don't know, Facebook account, LinkedIn account, Instagram, TikTok, who knows what, you know, all these things. Plus you also maybe participate in online forums and you have a website and all these things. So. You have lots of um, traces of you and manifestations of you in the online world already. You already have a dig digital self. Now, very scattered because you may have a part of it in, a, in an online game, another part at, at your job, another part in your Instagram account, and, and so on. Okay, But even today, most of your digital self does not belong to you. It belongs to Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> I mean, to, you know... Alpha to Omega to whatever you know companies um, exist that have the ownership of, of this digital self. So that raises first an important question. Now we have the version one of this digital self, uh, meaning you know this kind of scattered manifestations of you, what I call uh, semiotic pheromones. You know, like you you leave traces of meaning or or sense. Um, everywhere on the internet. And of course, it does not belong to you in most cases, unless you really make your own website, your own blog, you know, but in most cases, it belongs to those holding the platform. Okay. But more and more, I mean, in the next years, we will see the rise of AI that can represent you, that can become your digital self, your digital ambassador, because the same way it gathers millions and uh, billions and trillions of information on the web about, you know, on, on um, uh, Wikipedia, on forums, about general knowledge, but it can do the very same thing about you, Virginie, like the thousands and thousands and thousands of information you've already left uh, on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, Google, uh, your telephone company and all those things. Like you add, you know, all the GPS positions, your opinions, your tweets, uh, the pictures, family, um, how, you re how your finger works on Instagram. That says a lot of things about how your brain works, you know. Um, maybe your um, very private things on your sexuality and all these things. Like just put all this thing together and I have tens of thousands of data points, okay, that... Um, I could use, or we could use either in a good way, like, okay, what if that now starts to represent the real Virginie and my digital self or my digital bot, like my bot me uh, connects with your bot you. So they have an underlying conversation about lots of things, which we have no awareness, you and I as the, in our biological being. And what if our bots have actually not one-to-one -one conversation, but Millions and millions of conversations at the same time on Earth. Like my digital self in this very moment would have conversations, connections, opinions, tweets, whatever, with millions and millions and millions of other agents around the globe. Okay. And by the end of the day, it could tell me like, oh, you should meet with that person, by the way, because you have to do it, you know, or you should change something in your diary or you should date that person. It could become like an amazing, powerful counselor or someone you become also fully dependent on. Depends again, you know, both both sides. So the digital self here that I describe happens, um, and I would say in a kind of open world in the best case scenario case. But of course, the way the course um, it has today, well, Facebook um, wants your digital self. Google wants your digital self. The government wants your digital self. Like they want to control that. They want to 
you know, have it serve their own interest, either for security, for political ideologies or religious ideologies or business ideologies and all those things. So I think we have to worry about those things and ask the question today, how can AI become my friend, my servant, like the individual AI, and not just the general AI that we see in chat GPT, we will have in the near future um, trillions of uh, different AIs, you know? An AI for you, an AI for, I don't know, my camera, <laughs> whatever, interacting with one another. Does that make any sense? Yes, and actually I'm so glad that you're bringing uh, this conversation to this point where we are realizing that AI can take over our life. Um, I've often I might ask myself, why AI in this evolution, you know, again, going back to this narrative that we have about how humans species have evolved, why AI? And I want to share a theory that I have about why AI now, and I'm curious to know what you think. So uh, bear with me. So my theory of why AI is coming to existence today is that I believe that we unconsciously believe that AI is our savior. And what I mean by that is that we think AI will rescue us. And the reason is because if we look at how we've evolved and what we've done so far, we've killed our own species. We've harmed our planet. We're fearful creature. We're greedy. We're never satisfied and we're selfish. And we've tried everything. We've talked about it with other people. Um, We've shared these personality disorder with others. We've hired personal trainers, therapists, coaches, you know, and but nothing worked. So now the purpose and reason of AI is to save us from ourselves and create the world that we long for. Mm. What do you think? So I would maybe um, I would argue on a few words, like you say the purpose, I would say the potential uh, rather than purpose. It does have the potential to embrace such levels of complexity about climate change and about um, even our very uh, individual issues and struggles. You know, what if I had like a personal advisor that knows even better than me, uh, you know, what I, it could give me any advice that I ask for and become my best coach. Um, AI can certainly do that in the next few years, like better than even any coach, like a very benevolent kind of AI and help me run my life. But what if also AI became the best policymaker, um, could also even you know run for elections and make a fair society? I mean, it has the potential for, for those things. And then we, we would become you know the people asking for new things and AI would resolve very complex problems that we cannot even think of in our uh, human level. And even the best intentioned politicians cannot even embrace those things. And by the way, I've said those things for so many years from my field of collective intelligence, saying that, um, and not just claiming, but uh, kind of uh, observing as a scientist that pyramidal collective intelligence, pyramidal structures, companies, governments, administrations, armies, religion, everything pyramidal, has produced the complex world, complex world in which we live, and cannot embrace the challenges of complexity that has provoked. You always need, evolution always need a more embracing, a more encompassing system to embrace the next level of complexity. And evolution has always worked through those kind of quantum leaps, you know, like from one level of complexity to the next one and the next one. Hence, we don't have a a world made only with bacteria anymore. We have a world made with human beings and trees and uh, you know and all the and computers and all those things. So, from an evolutionary perspective, evolution will either fail and collapse because it does not happen in a linear way. Sometimes you have like you know it has to fail and then to start over again, but it can also upgrade itself very quickly. And a whole part of um, the transhumanist movement says this also, like don't count on biological evolution and even biological substrate to uh, address 
the level of complexity of the world. No fucking way. Like, don't even think of uh, elections or changing institutions or making a new constitution. It will address those things. It may improve, of course. I don't see it as completely neutral. But the real leap that we need has to happen in an evolutionary leap, which I always say myself. I've always said those, those things. An AI has the potential to play a fantastic role there, just like electricity, but you can also kill someone with electricity. You can run horrible, horrendous things with electricity. So just I would just argue on the potential, or I mean the purpose versus potential. Although, just like you, I claim that no new thing happens randomly. Like mm -hmm. the writing happens because of the need for the tribal world to move into a civilizational world. Um, because then you could unite more, you know, millions of human beings, which the tribal world or tribal reality cannot do. And you needed the writing to do those things. And it changed everything, not only externally, but also in our inner um, subjective space as well. And so I think um, if we, you and I will live in long enough in the next few years and the next decades, we will see, I think, a level of leap uh, so important, like an evolutionary leap, um, a species leap or a species um, evolution. But it may also go very, very bad, <laughs> I think. So, what do you think about that? So, yes, I, uh, I, I like your answer. And I think what you're saying is that it, it is up to us individually and collectively to know how to use this AI. And I, I wanna end, I, I know we could talk for hours, and um, but I wanna end with this last question, which is a little bit more practical. I mean, you, you advise and you help leaders um, on, on a regular basis. So wh what's another way, now that we've set up the context and the possibility for AI to become our greatest savior or our worst nightmare, um, what is a way, maybe a more positive or constructive way to see and experience artificial intelligence and chat GPT? Um, is it, you know, what should people, how should people look at this um, in a more constructive way? Um, what do you think? I was going to say, I was going to add, well, you, you pointed earlier that we need to learn from social media that the social media damages that we today acknowledge we need to learn from that from that uh, and and bring this knowledge this understanding to ai um but what do you think what mm, how can okay. people see ai in a more positive and constructive way Well, do you ask like see or do something? Because we can always see the two faces of a coin. So then just a matter of, of seeing. But if you ask, you know, what could they do to contribute uh, to a better world with the leverage of AI, then that may lead to a few thoughts that I, I can share. Yes, there. let's go. Let's go that path. Okay. Um, so let me start with the bad, new, the bad news. I don't think any... Um, vote, you know, your ballot will will change uh, anything. I mean, it can change something in the old world, in the old mindset, like, you know, would you put more money on school or on warfare and all these kind of things that we see in the conventional geopolitical pyramidal world as we know it today. And for most people, that remains the ultimate reality. Like they don't think, you know, um, outside, of, outside of that box, okay? However, I would... Um, First, I would invite people to become knowledgeable in the forthcoming technologies like the crypto technologies and everything that will enable distributed organizations and distributed uh, societies to rise rather than giving your power and uh, your um, uh, sovereignty to other people. Uh, you, we have now the means to use better tools. And they arrive, you know, like the next five years, you will have the capacity to use this tool uh, easily without having, you know, the need of any savviness on, the, on those things. They will just look like conventional tools that we have on our cell phones, but they will not operate through uh, one centralized platform that belongs to a few people. 
it will work in a completely distributed way. So we need to become knowledgeable in those technologies and usages of distributed applications because distributed means distributed power, distributed currencies, you know, distributed voice and all those things rather than centralized and, uh, and with, you know, those hierarchies and social castes as we know them. And I don't mean like a, a bad criticism of them. I just say they don't work anymore. <laughs> They've done their job, you know, maybe we needed those, uh, those things. But now that they face, uh, we face a world that requires highly individualized people and highly individualized people means social complexity. And highly individualized people do not like to work in, in social pyramids and, and hierarchies. They want to have their own sovereignty and interact in a mutual you know, uh, dependency, interdependency, rather than getting dependent on some kind of social hierarchy. Okay, so if you want that, then okay, good. Hey, but maybe you need an infrastructure for that. Maybe you need some technologies, including AI and distributed applications that give the technical substrate for this. And how do you get that? Well, by having the awareness of this and, be, and then become you know, a supporter and um, an actor, a player of those things. And you have many ways. First, understand that, talk about it, communicate about it become a beta, beta testers, you know, all, you have so many ways, develop new things, train new things where your communities, you know, you, have, you can play this kind of game. So I think the real shift can happen here. And the second thing, using also those technologies, uh, free ourselves from money and use free currencies, other forms of currencies, because as long as, you know, we may all want to not become dependent on the, uh, um, bad AI, you know, well, okay, but we have this race, this crazy race, like we all see it in a completely powerless position, like, okay, everyone needs to win the race, even with well-intentioned people. And that means you got to make, you know, AI stronger and stronger and stronger without even checking what it'll do. And that can become a very terrible thing called, you know, the, call it the tragedy of the commons. Um, and you have many other kind of systemic emerging effects that just drive us collectively onto the wall, even if ind independently, individually, we want to go in the other direction. So the individual will does not suffice. We need to understand the systemic forces and what drives the main driver of those systemic forces today has a name, money. We need to use other currencies that will drive a complete different completely different uh, social contract. That's why cryptocurrency is so important, not so much about alternative to fiat money, but it's because it opens a door to a new form of power. Uh, and it, it, it empower it, it allows mm -hmm. other forms of communities to create values. And that leads the society to move away from being dominated by money. But that's a whole conversation, a whole yeah. other conversation. I really like what you're saying. And, and really what, what I'm getting from what you just said was that ChatGPT as a first element of artificial intelligence is not just about finding titles um, or creating content or even asking, uh, you know, the tools to do a number of things, creating tables, et cetera. But it's about not waiting to wait on other people to tell you what to do. This is about taking your power back and choosing to spend time and acquiring knowledge on what this tool can do for us individually and collectively and being part of those discussions. Yes, absolutely. Um, what, what you and what you said about you know like um, cryptocurrencies, um, I would maybe add a, a little thing to what you said. Like, do they provide some next level um, of you know distribution of power? Absolutely, yes. But we have to see it. I think as just like the early days of the writing. In the early days of the writing, you had an elite controlling mm -hmm. the writing. You had you had the scribes, you know, the knowledgeable people who would control, and then would control society with this. Okay, and it took. A few thousand years uh, before it became, you know, accessible to everyone, and then you can really have an explosion of ideas and communication and the growth of culture and knowledge. But for the most part, if you look at the past five thousand years, 
in most places, the um, the democratization of writing and reading happened like very, very, very recently. Okay, and I think we see the same stage now. I hope it will take more than I mean less than five thousand years, but we see the same stage like today. Cryptocurrencies are remain control in the hands of highly literate people, even those with good intentions, but also in the control of uh, big powers. You know, big investment fan- funds who make, you know, the ups and downs, you know, the pump and dump yeah. thing on cryptos. And it has turned into a very insane kind of game in the old world. And it doesn't mean it doesn't have the potential. Just like, see the writing, same mm-hmm. thing. It has a huge potential. But today, we haven't used uh, and harnessed the real potential of both, you know, cryptocurrencies and soon to come crypto technologies that embrace something much bigger. Fantastic. Well, on that note... Thank you so much for spending the time with me and the the people who are going to benefit from this wonderful conversation. There's so many nuggets that you said. It was really enlightening, and I I can't wait to go back and just listen. We'll do a blog post as well, as we do as always, try to bring sense um, and clarity to a world that is very complex. So thank you so much, Jean-Francois. My pleasure, Virginie. Whenever you want, we can have any of those conversations. Thank you.